testing. That sounded good. So we do this thing called the Cape Downtown Series, where once a month we bring one of our distinguished professors to talk about the cutting edge work that they're doing here at the City Club. And you get a free breakfast, and you get a one hour worth of CLE credit, and you get to hear about something that you might not have known about. Um, and get some exposure to our law professors, who we are trying to make sure are coming down to downtown and not just hanging out in University Circle. Um, on the other hand, University Circle is really beautiful this time of year. Um, so if you haven't been out there lately, come out to the museums, um, visit the law school. We have just renovated our new courtroom, and we're excited to start having programs there that you're invited to. Um, this week, we have a big program on Friday. It's our major international law conference, and it celebrates the 25th anniversary of the endowment of our Cox International Law Center. And this is also the International Law Association's International Law Weekend. Huge conference, and it looks at the foreign policy and international law legacy of the Obama administration. So, at the six year point, when we're in the middle of the debate and thinking about the next president, it gives us a chance to pause and see where this president has taken us and critique the direction that that is going. So, if you guys want to take off on Friday and, and come out, that's not at the law school, it's behind the law school at the Tink and Beale University Center, which is the new building that the university has. Um, which is sort of the area where there's a food court and conference centers and all of our law students are now interacting with the professional students and the undergrads and it's really tied the university together. So if you haven't seen it before, come out. Um, you just park at the Severus parking garage and you go straight upstairs and it's directly above the parking garage. So today, I'm going to tell you about how our war on ISIS is changing international law. And this was based on a book that I did a couple of years ago before ISIS was even invented. And I was looking at the issue of the predator drone strikes. Um, but suddenly, the research that I was doing has become much, much more relevant. And uh, really, what's going on with ISIS is scary and surprising. And so I'm going to give you some information that you may not have known before. This picture happens to me at the International Court of Justice. Um, you're not allowed to have pictures taken there. Uh, there's a guy named Chris Greenwood, who's the ICJ judge from the UK, who spoke in at Case Westerns. So he quickly snapped my picture there, and he said, now get the heck out before I get in trouble. But you'll see that this is relevant to the presentation. OK, so who is ISIS? Um, I bet a lot of you two years ago had never heard of ISIS. Even last year, when you started to see the news about the Azadi, you're like, what is this group? And, and why are we starting to hear so much about them? And, where did they come from? The interesting thing about ISIS is that this is one of those unintended consequences stories. When we invaded Iraq in 2003, we hopscotched right into Baghdad because we were worried about the chemical weapon potentially being used against us. And so we left a lot of unguarded arms caches. Then when we took over very quickly, Paul Bremer, who was the occupying power, made a very faithful decision. At the time, I thought this was a great decision. It, it was consistent with my human rights instinct. It was a horrible decision. So the decision was, let's take everybody who was in the army, who was a Baathist, which is about 90%, and those are the supporters of Saddam Hussein's regime. And let's, in particular, take the Republican Guard, which was a large portion of the army, and they were the elite troops. And let's ban them from ever being in the army or any official position for the rest of their lives. Now, I thought it was a good idea because these guys were, you know, Saddam Hussein supporters, and to have them around could be pernicious <laughs> and dangerous. But what I and Bremer and I guess the entire government didn't contemplate is that when you unemploy the second largest army in the world, and they have nothing better to do, but they have access to arms caches, 
And they see that the new government is Shiite dominated when they're from the Sunni faction, they become an insurgency. And so immediately, we were faced with an insurgency in Iraq, and we thought we had it quashed when we did the surge. But really what they did is they just kind of went under their shell. A lot of them went into Syria. And meanwhile, in Syria, there's a civil war. And it's become, in most of Syria, an area that is a failed state, a government-free zone. And this is the kind of place that is really nice habitat for a organization like um, the former Iraqi military to spawn a new organization of insurgents. So first they called themselves Al-Qaeda of Iraq. And then they called themselves the ISI, um, the Islamic State of Iraq. And then when they moved over to Syria, they added the ISIS, which is the Islamic State for Iraq and Syria. And that's why we call them ISIS. Uh, meanwhile, the military in Iraq was mostly um, not, it wasn't very religious. And, and so um, it's you know, non-secular. And they started to bring in and, and use the religious veil as a way to attract more support. But I, I wonder if this means that the people in the military are, although I think they're still making the military decisions, whether they're losing control of ISIS. So meanwhile, ISIS starts to become very rich. And the way they do this is by attacking Mosul and Tikrit, two cities in Iraq that were mostly Sunnis. And the Iraqi military, which were Shiite that we had trained, um, were defending these cities. It was 3,000 ISIS military against 30,000 Iraqi military. And the Iraqi military didn't even engage. They just ran away. They left all of our great equipment that we'd given them, so Humvees, surface-to-air missiles, machine guns, um, tanks. They have lots of tanks. I mean, they are super well armed. But not only that, but we had put a whole lot of financial aid, humanitarian aid, in the banks of Mosul and Tikrit. And they just scooped up that money and the gold that we left. And now they have $2 billion. Now they also, in Syria, took over a bunch of oil wells and refineries. And they started selling the ISIS-produced oil on the spot market. And up until very recently, there was no UN Security Council resolution that said, don't buy from ISIS. And even the re now that we have a resolution like that, it's not really working. So, you know, oil is very permeable. If they can get it out, anybody will buy it. And they are becoming very rich. So they have over $2 billion. Compare that to the other terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda, FARC, Al-Shabaab, Hamas, and they are the super rich. They are the Beverly Hill um, billies of uh, terrorist organizations. Um, they also are making a lot of money on buying and selling, well, stealing and selling artifacts. Um, and so you know that they have recently exploded some of the most beautiful ancient cities in Syria, but they also take the little statues and things that they can, that are mobile, and they sell them on the black market, and it gives them a tremendous amount of money. Okay, so. With all this money, one of the things they've done is created a huge propaganda tool. And if you go online, and I don't really recommend you do this, but if you do, you will see in English many very, very Hollywood-style commercials that they have produced, like this one. This says, this is our call of duty, um, and we're spawned in Jana. I have no idea what that means, but apparently it, it makes people want to join them. Um, and they are getting joined by the thousands. And the people that are joining them are not just from the Middle East, but also from the United States and Western Europe, Latin America, Africa. Everybody who is Islamic and feels disenchanted is being invited to join the club. And they are going in droves. So they have gone from 3,000 to 80,000 people. With all these people and all this money, they have been taking over land. And this makes them very different than other tourists organizations that we've dealt with. Uh, most terrorist organizations want to defeat us, or maybe they want to topple a government. These guys want to conquer territory. And so in Syria, they have about half of the territory. In Iraq, they have about half the territory. They are a huge amount of space controlled by ISIS, 35,000 square miles of captured territory. And with all this territory, 
they have put in a very repressive and one might even characterize it as evil form of government because what they do is they do beheadings, they do mass executions, they are very much into subjugating the women and mistreating people who they see as different and they see just about everybody as different. Um, so, the result of all this is the biggest refugee flow in the world since World War II. This has been in the news in the last two weeks. Europe, the United States are trying to take in people from Syria. Um, this has been a year and a half in the making, but it's just now reached a crescendo. And the problem is we can't take in all these people. Um, some of these people are well-educated and have business sense and can come in and, and do white-collar work, but many, many of them are not. Um, and they're just fleeing to get out of this horrible situation. So there is a picture of a Jordanian refugee camp. And unlike the ones in Saudi Arabia, which I saw in the newspaper, I think, yesterday, that they have air-conditioned tents, this is not a place that you'd want to live for any amount of time. And my guess is that the refugees from ISIS are going to end up being stuck here for decades. It's going to be like the old Palestinians. It's going to be the Syrians. And we'll be dealing with whatever kind of ramifications that creates in each of our countries, including in the Middle East. Now, the major events that finally got the United States to take military action are listed here. The first was in June of last year when ISIS took control of Mosul and Tikrit. And as I said, basically the Iraqi military just ran away. And that was very much a blow to what the Obama administration thought they were leaving behind in Iraq. Then in July, they took control of the Syrian oil and gas fields. And by August, they were attacking different minority groups, including in particular the Azadis. And this was the first time I really started paying attention to what was going on. You remember a year ago, 40,000 Yazadis, who are sort of a Kurdish um, sect, were herded up to Mount Sinjar, which is a very high mountain, right near where their cities were. And their cities were burned out. So they all went up to the mountains to save their lives. And then they ran out of food, they ran out of water. But with our high technology media, we could see them starving on the mountain. So we all saw media images of people literally dropping dead. And there's 40,000 of them who would die within a week. So President Obama is sitting there in the White House. He has no Security Council authorization. He can't argue this is self-defense. He knows this is a horrible humanitarian disaster. And he finally says, we just have to do something. Because we can, we have to do something. So he calls out the military, and we do airstrikes in and around Mount Sinjar, which is Iraqi territory. At this time, we do not have the Iraq government's approval to do this. This is unilateral humanitarian intervention. And it's, it's very narrow, it's very um, short duration, and it's successful. Um, the ISIS people flee, the Kurds come in and escort the Azadis down from the mountain, and the Azadis now um, have survived. We saved 40,000 people. A wonderful humanitarian success story. Um, then by September 23rd, the United States decided that it would start attacking ISIS throughout Syria and Iraq. By this point, Iraq's government has said, please help us. ISIS is a threat to us. We have given you approval to use military force in Iraq. But the Syrian government has not done that. And that's because the Syrian government is run by Assad, who the United States has labeled one of the worst rogue despots in the world. And we have said we want him to be gone. Um, and we don't want him to be given asylum somewhere. We'd like to see him prosecuted for using chemical weapons against his own people and committing other crimes against humanity. So we're in there doing airstrikes. Now, these airstrikes are not the pinpoint drone strikes that we've seen against al-Qaeda for the last 10 years. These airstrikes are major air attacks by our fleets of aircraft with huge amounts of bombs. And this map shows you all the different areas in Syria where they're attacking. But it's not just the F-16s we're using. We're also using the huge Tomahawk cruise missiles. And again, this is not your Predator drone. This is a giant missile that is launched from the sea. It looks like that picture in the middle. One missile can destroy the entire parts of the city. They're, they're very powerful. And we are launching these in Syria without the Syrian government's approval. So this begs the big question. What is our legal justification 
for attacking ISIS in Syria without the Syrian government's approval. And the UN Charter has this Article 2, Paragraph 4, which is the cornerstone of international law. It's sort of the first commandment, the Ten Commandments of international <coughs> law. Thou shalt not invade another country. And literally it says, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or the political independence of any state. And there's only three exceptions to this rule written into the charter and recognized under international law. The first one is where you have the consent of the territorial state. And as I mentioned, Iraq has said we can use force in Iraq against ISIS. So when we use force in Iraq, that's fine. No violation of international law. But Syria has absolutely not said this. They've said the opposite. They protest that we are not working with them against ISIS, that we are unilaterally dropping these bombs and sending in these cruise missiles. The second is if the Security Council of the United Nations authorizes the use of force. And this would seem to be one where you know, nobody likes ISIS. They're very much a threat to the whole world. Um, and why can't the Security Council just get together and authorize this? Well, the answer is boot. So we have a Russian problem now, um, much like we did during the height of the Cold War, and it's getting worse on a daily basis. Our relationship with Russia is getting so bad that the Obama administration leaked out a report by the Defense Department that said that um, Putin is suffering from Asperger's disease. Now, there's three problems I have with that. Okay, The first is, if we really did a study, that would be kept highly confidential. So. Obviously, the White House itself, uh, uh, President Obama himself, said, yes, let's leave that out. Uh, the second thing is they say in the study that this is based on looking at news footage of Putin, and you can tell, obviously, he has Asperger's. And if you talk to psychiatrists, psychologists, they say, no, you can't diagnose Asperger's that way. The third thing is this. There's nothing wrong with Asperger's. Um, it's not like some horrible, insane you know, quality. It's um, uh, on the level of um, autism, it's the, the very highly functional um, level. And there are many, I think there are many law students that I teach and others around us that have some form of Asperger's. But the U.S. is trying to use this to say Putin is insane. And therefore, he's demonized and he can do, you know, bellicose things against him. And that's the level of sort of animosity that the Obama administration has for the Russian regime. The Russian regime has it 10 times worse against us. And so Putin is pretty clear that anything we want in the Middle East, he's going to veto. And, and that's what he's doing. So we have no possibility of getting Security Council authorization. And pretty much anything we want in the next couple of years, we're not going to get through the Security Council. Because Putin's policy is basically to frustrate the United States. And it's, it's kind of sad because this is really a return to the Cold War um, in our relations with Russia. And that just kind of happened you know, quietly over the last year or so. Okay, so finally, we can argue self-defense. That's what we usually argue. When we don't have Security Council authorization, when we don't have approval, when all else fails, say it's self-defense. The nice thing about Article 51 of the UN Charter is you can claim self-defense on your own behalf or on behalf of one of your allies. So if Israel or even Iraq said, we need you to act against ISIS because we feel that there's an imminent threat against us, then we could claim that as self-defense. And that is, in fact, more or less the, the best argument we have. However, um, there is one really big problem with using self-defense in this context, and that is that the International Court of Justice, this is the same place that I was sitting in front of in that first picture, has ruled twice, once before 9-11 and once after 9-11, that if you are attacking non-state actors, in a country. You can't just do that unless you can prove that the country where they exist is somehow in effective control over them. And that actually makes sense because there are plenty of countries that have non-state actors that are acting in their borders that the country doesn't control. Even the United States, we have drug traffickers, we have terrorists, we have um, neo this and that. Uh, who are doing things that we don't necessarily have effective control over. They might threaten foreign countries, and that should not be a license for the foreign country to come and send cruise missiles or major you know, 
airstrikes in our territory where they exist. So what they say in the ICJ parlance is um, only if the country has effective control of the terrorist organization can you attack the terrorists using self-defense in that context. Okay, so the United States has come up with four arguments, and these are in chronological order, and each of them has been problematic. And the biggest problem is that we don't have a single argument, because in international law, if you come up with an argument, and you are consistent with it, and the rest of the world buys into it, then international law accepts it, and you can move on, and it becomes the new international norm. But if you have many different inconsistent arguments, it doesn't effectively build your case politically or legally. And this is the problem that we're having. So the first argument we had is, we have to do the airstrikes because of humanitarian intervention. And this, in fact, was what we did for the Azadis, and that made sense. But we've continued to say, we've got to stamp out ISIS because when ISIS occupies territory, they are beheading people, they are repressing people, they are murdering people on a mass scale. And so we have to do this for humanitarian reasons. The problem with this argument is that there is no humanitarian exception written into the UN Charter. And every time a country has used this historically, the rest of the world says, nice try, but you can't do that without Security Council authorization. We did have sort of a zenith, a high point with this argument in 1999 when the NATO troops bombed Serbia to protect the Kosovar Albanians. And after an 86 bombing day bombing campaign, uh, Kosovo has become more or less independent now. Um, the Serbs have pulled out, the UN has gone in, and the situation is much better, and maybe a half a million people were saved. Based on this, the United Kingdom says there is an emerging right of, of humanitarian intervention. Interestingly, the United States did not like that precedent, in particular because the Russians have misused this precedent in just a couple of years later when they attacked South Ossetia, Georgia. So this Russian boot is them attacking Georgia. That's not the U.S. state of Georgia. That's the former Soviet Republic. And at the time, Obama said, look, they're claiming this amorphous right of self of uh, humanitarian intervention. And it just doesn't exist. It's not a legal justification. We can't accept that. It's too easily manipulated and abused. So once we said that about the Russians, and once we recognized that humanitarian intervention is, is a hard concept to identify and apply in very narrow grounds, uh, this is not really a good argument for the United States. The UK, on the other hand, they would like humanitarian intervention to become a new norm of international law. This is a place where the US and the UK disagree. So the US comes up with a second argument. A couple of months after they said humanitarian intervention, they said, oh, it's OK that we attack ISIS in Syria because Assad and his government does not control the areas of Syria where we're acting. So this is basically a failed state. Now the problem with this argument is, as this map shows, there are at least 20 other places on Earth that are failed states or that there are territories that are part of the state beyond the control of the government. And this would say that this is a free-for-all. Any country could go in and attack those areas, that the concept of territorial integrity disappears once you lose control of parts of your state. And this would be very unstable, destabilizing. And again, it would be a big invitation, I think, for Russia to attack some of the former Soviet republics, because Putin really has designs and we incorporating much of that territory. This is something the United States wants to push against. So this is not a precedent that the United States is going to want to be accepted. So the third argument is the most bizarre of all. And this is <laughs> Secretary of State Kerry goes to the Senate and he explains our rationale. And he says, it's the right of hot pursuit on land. And, and the Senate says, well, we've heard of hot pursuit in the seas, because that's always been accepted in international law. But what's this hot pursuit in land? Isn't that a new concept? And he goes, no, no, no. We did it back in 1918 against Pancho Villa. <laughs> And, and of course, down here, you know, Kerry had some experience. We did it against the Viet Cong um, during the Vietnam War. So Pancho there, as you know, was a bandito from Mexico. He was raiding the uh, Mexican, uh, Texas, and Arizona border. And we sent 4,400 of our federales down to apprehend him. 
and they <coughs> wore through much of Mexico and they never found him. He, he was never apprehended. He lived a nice long life. But the Mexican government was really upset that we invaded them and said, is this an act of war? We think it is. And we pulled out and we apologized and we made reparations. We said, we won't do that again. We recognize we can't do that. There's no hot pursuit against this guy. Well, the, the next one is even worse. So during the Vietnam War, the Viet Cong would go from North Vietnam down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to South Vietnam and attack our allies there. And so we would use Agent Orange to clear them out of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and they decided to go next door to Laos and Cambodia, and Nixon decided to do a secret bombing campaign, which when it became public, almost led to his impeachment before Watergate. It was a really bad moment for the Nixon administration, and they had to say, yes, we understand that you can't just drop bombs on a foreign country that you're not at war with, that you're neutral or allied with, just because they're non-state actors that are sneaking through their territory that you want to get rid of. So these two are the precedents that Secretary of State Kerry was basically invoking when he said there's a right of hot pursuit on land. This would be really bad if, if this was the precedent. So they stopped saying this. Finally, they come down to what is now their argument, and that is that you can have self-defense against non-state actors when the country where they're located is unable or unwilling to quell the threat against you. And this is, you know, there's some international law that, that backs this up. If you think about the law of neutrality, the way it works is, let's say it's World War II, Switzerland is a neutral country, Germany is against us, and we're the United States. So the German troops are not supposed to go and occupy Switzerland, a neutral territory. They're not supposed to go through it. They're not supposed to use it as a base of operations because that would disrupt Switzerland's neutrality. Under the law of neutrality, if they do that, we can't attack Switzerland, but we can attack the German troops where they're located as long as we're really careful not to hurt anybody else that is outside of the German troops. That's sort of the theory here. So you're applying the law of neutrality to the terrorists. You're saying that if the country is unable or unwilling to stop the threat, then something has to happen. The, the UN Charter can't be a suicide pact. So the problem, though, is the question of whether Syria is unwilling and unable. And this becomes a problem because the Assad regime wants to take advantage of this moment. And they say, we too hate ISIS. And we would like very much to destroy them. So why don't you partner with us? Why don't you work alongside of us? Tell us when the airstrikes are going to be and where they're going to be. Let us help you with the coordination of the strikes or even have our military join you in these airstrikes. So they are willing. And of course we say, no, Assad regime, we hate you. We do not want to work with you. We do not want to give you any credibility at all. You use chemical weapons against your population. You're not going to be our partner. At the same time, they say, well, we're, it's not that we're unable. It's that we would be able if you worked with us. So they, they want to conflate the two. Um, but this is our, our best argument. The other problem with this argument is that while we were attacking ISIS, we decided to do some opportunistic airstrikes against other terrorist organizations that were in the Al-Qaeda umbrella, um, and one called the al qaeda And these guys are located up near Damascus. They're nowhere near Iraq. They're not a threat to Iraq. They're not a threat to Israel, and they are not operationalized um, like you know, Al-Qaeda generally, so that we didn't know if there were any plans in the work, for example. We didn't have any intelligence. We just knew that they were bad. But we, we attacked them too. And that seems to be an abuse of this doctrine, which weakens the doctrine. So we use as our precedent for this doctrine the predator drone strikes that we've been doing for the last 10 years against Al-Qaeda. And you may not have known the extent of these strikes throughout the world, but we have been doing this in Libya, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And in some of those countries, the governments will say, oh, please do come in and do airstrikes. Just tell us when and where, and, and we'll work with you on it. Um, some of the countries said that originally, and then pulled back, and, and didn't want them anymore because our airstrikes <laughs> often kill innocent people. Um, and sometimes, like in Pakistan, they get really, really mad at us and start protesting on a daily basis to the UN that we're doing all these predator drone strikes in their territory. So this is not uncontroversial, but it does seem to be getting some traction. 
And I would say ISIS is so unpopular around the world, even, as I said, the Syrian government hates ISIS, that there isn't a lot of protest right now about what we're doing. So if the Obama administration can come up with one legal argument and kind of put it within bounds and not misuse it, there's a very good chance that it will become politically acceptable. And we'll see soon, because the UK will have a vote in its parliament on whether to join us in attacking ISIS in Syria very soon. And this will be the bellwether of that. Um, and, and second, whether it's internationally acceptable from a legal point of view. And again, under international law, that happens when there's widespread consent or lack of protest to some new doctrine. But if you're developing new doctrines, you've got to be very careful. Um, because of the huge threat that ISIS poses, and they really pose a threat beyond Syria, beyond Iraq, to all of the Middle East, and even they can hopscotch into Africa, they are growing daily. I believe that there is a moment now for there to be the, the political will, and even Putin's government is going to have a hard time complaining about this. I wrote a book, as I mentioned, about the accelerated formation of customary international law, where I had a chapter looking at the legality of the predator drone strikes. And at the end of the chapter, I say, you know, there's sort of a crisis brewing in Syria, and this might be the test. Now, two years later, I've just written a, an updated law review article that will be coming out in our own Case Western Journal related to the conference we're having on Friday, where I apply the lessons of the book to the facts that I've just told you about, making the argument that I've just told you, which is if we're smart and stop using all these crazy legal arguments and just come out with one, and that we're very careful on how we carve it out and how we apply it, that we can build smart international law that will help us defeat ISIS both politically and legally. I want to also mention that you can't just defeat ISIS with airstrikes or with the law. In the end, what's breeding the growth of ISIS is the fact that the Assad government is a repressive regime. And the people that are fighting against him, that used to be the, the moderate rebels, don't really have any other choice right now. The only game in town is ISIS, so they're joining ISIS. Over in Iraq, the al-Maliki government, which is the one that we installed after our occupation, was very repressive against the Sunnis. And so in those places like Mosul and Tikrit, the reason ISIS was able to get a stronghold there is because they were Sunni-dominated cities who felt disenfranchised by the central government, and they were just looking for some alternative. And that's still the way two-thirds of Iraq is. Now, we put pressure in Iraq for al-Maliki to step down. And there is a new prime minister and a coalition government, and it remains to be seen whether they can be smart and stop repressing the Sunnis and bring them in. And it's a real challenge, because it's hard not to repress somebody who's fighting against you. Uh, but if you don't, they're just going to continue to get support. So part of the story here is not just that we need a legal argument to fight ISIS, but we also have to be smart about taking away the cause of ISIS's growth, which is basically strong men who are repressive against Sunnis in this part of the world. So um, that is the end of my presentation. I want to spend uh, the next half hour answering your questions. And then when you're done, I want to tell you some exciting stuff that's going on at the law school. So uh, what kind of questions do you have? Margaret. Um, Australia, what's their position on all this stuff? And the, prime, the PM just resigned. Or yeah, something. yeah. So has it, uh, in, is it in connection with this? No. but. So both in Canada and in Australia, there are conservative governments that are very much in favor of our policies of attacking ISIS in Syria. And in Canada, I think in both places, um, there are a lot of people who are not in favor of it. And so this is actually one of the election issues in both places. So uh, I don't think the government fell over ISIS. That wasn't the key issue. In fact, they've had immigration issues that, as you know, we're putting a lot of pressure on them. But it, it is going to be an issue in their campaigns. And, and it also, watch the Canadian campaign that's going on right now. Um, this is a major part of the, the whole foreign policy of the Harper government is an issue. And right now, I think they're saying it's too close to tell who's going to win the campaign. And it, you know, if you're 
closest ally right to your door changes their foreign policy, it can have an effect on you as well. Yes, cool. Uh, I want to have sort of a larger question um, on, uh, I, I, I didn't realize the title of your last book, uh, The First is Ferocious. Yeah. So, as I uh, remember Ferocious, uh, part of the justification of uh, international law and any of the particular rules under it have to do with natural law theory. Yes. And that part of uh, sort of a, a number of things to get to a conclusion you all might not agree with. Uh, so part, so don't keep saying yes. You might, you might well, so far, you're getting me down the primer. This is what so, we do in class, right? So, <laughs> if, and, and part of that is, it, is that there are certain horrors under international law, under natural law, that Grotius is going to condemn as violations of, under his rights theory of, of uh, any international practice. So slavery, and piracy, and then eventually genocide became the holy trinity of, of the kind of Grotian theory. And it, and it seems to me that if you then take, if you then impose Brandeis on Grotius and take a look at how Brandeis came up with the right to privacy by by taking a look at the logic of the law, not the explicit privacy rights. But he wrote the, the, his famous article in, in the 1890s based on the logic of American law is that there ought to be a privacy right, so there is. Why can't you simply, um, with your air edition, take the, the Grotian view, take a look at the natural rights theory which triggers the international rights theory, take a look at this holy trinity and say, the logic of that trinity also argues against the kind of conduct of, of ISIL, beheading people, uh, enslaving women, uh, uh, executing minorities, uh, 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 ruling, I mean, uh, destroying uh, 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 holy sites and historical sites. And you don't need any of the other justifications. You've just taken the Grotian uh, uh, basis of international law, which you, would, uh, at, at whose feet you worship by by, by putting the, put the title yeah. and, and, and simply uh, solve that and, and mail it into Obama. Okay, so there's two things I want to say about this. One is, so Grotius wrote in 1640, well, 1620 up to 1643, um, the Peace of Westphalia. And much of what Grotius conceived is anachronistic now. The reason I use him for the title of my book is that one of the things he did is he conceived of the entire state system, which was then put in the Peace of Westphalia and very quickly became the modern state system. And people call that a Grotian moment. So if you're looking for something when the law changes very fundamentally and radically, in the US, we call those constitutional moments. So the New Deal the period, for example, was seen as a constitutional moment. Some people want to call these international constitutional moments, but we're not really talking about a constitution or even a treaty. So, Grotian moment, you know, is using the Grotius title in that narrow frame. Now, on the other hand, the whole thing I was talking about, um, the 1999 intervention in Serbia, I was in favor of that. And I was in favor of the idea of responsibility to protect, which grew out of that. It's the R2P doctrine. And so what happened was the United Nations said that the attacks that we did, the NATO attacks on Serbia, were unlawful but legitimate. And then everybody said, well, what the heck does that mean? If it's unlawful, how can it be legitimate? And I suppose one analogy would be in criminal law, um, sometimes, you know, even though you're breaking the law, nobody's going to convict you for it because it's the right thing to do. Maybe battered woman syndrome would be an example of that. So maybe that's what they were talking about. But a group of experts came together to write up the boundaries of what they thought would be for legitimate humanitarian intervention. And they wrote this report, the R2P report. And they said, basically, if you have the right intention, so you're not going in for a pretext like Russia does. You're going in really to save lives. And if you have um, limited means, you're, you're only working when it's necessary, and you're doing it proportionately, and thirdly, if you're doing it in the face of genocide or crimes against humanity, so things that really are of a scale of that level, which this might well be. If you have that constellation, and then you go in and you're very narrow, and then you leave as soon as you're done and you don't occupy it forever, that should be acceptable. And the report was actually very widely hailed until it got to the UN Security Council. And the UN Security Council, which is governed by the US and the five other 
permanent members of the veto were scared to heck of, of this doctrine and how it might be abused by each other. And so they said, yes, we like the responsibility to protect doctrine, but only when it's authorized by the Security Council. So they, they literally took all the wind out of it. They said, yes, there should be a responsibility of governments to not kill their people and to protect them from genocide. And when they don't do it, yes, there should be an international responsibility to intervene, but only when the Security Council authorizes it. And they didn't even agree to say, which was a proposal at the time, we won't veto those kinds of actions. Or we'll only, one option was to have a double veto. So you have to have two countries veto that. So where we are legally is that the countries that control the world, through the Security Council, through the system of the United Nations that was set up after World War II, have made sure that this Russian moment of humanitarian intervention didn't bloom. And, and that's where we are. Yes? Well, along that same line then, what is going to be the import of this recent uh, revelation that Russia is sending uh, troops into Syria? Well, so as I said, I think Russia's main foreign policy goal in Syria and the Middle East is just to frustrate whatever we want. Because Putin sees that anything he can do to slow down the United States, to frustrate us, heightens him. Also, the Assad regime has given Putin a um, freshwater port in the Mediterranean. It's his only freshwater port. Um, and that's very important to Russia. Um, and finally, they're buying a lot of Russian weapons at a time when Russia's economy is reeling because the price of oil has gone down and it's sort of helping them. So there's a lot of reasons why Putin is doing this. What do you expect to be our response to that? Well, our response should be, don't you dare do that, but what are we going to do to stop them? Right? So they'll, they'll say, well, what are you going to do? Pass a UN Security Council resolution? We'll veto that. Um, when you yell and scream at us, we don't really care about that. You, you've been calling me uh, Asperger's guy, so <laughs> not really happy with you anyway. Um, I, I think they will try to prop up the Syrian regime with, with weapons. Um, interestingly, the Syrian regime may use those against ISIS. Um, there are those in the United States who say, we don't care how much you hate Assad. The biggest threat right now is ISIS. Let's partner with them. Let's get rid of ISIS. Then we can deal with Assad. It's very Machiavellian, but the Obama administration is not willing to do that because they have politically, over and over again, said we will have nothing to do with Assad. He is a murderer, he's used chemical weapons, he's you know, more or less evil. Um, and, and it would be hard, I think, for them to cross that line. But you know, it depends how much you're into realpolitik, um, whether it's sequencing. What would the next president do? Because this isn't going away. Um, what, what would the, what would, Donald Trump did. Let's hear tonight. Let's put the <laughs> President Trump tonight. But oh, build a wall around Syria. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, but I, I do think that the Russians will do that, and they'll they'll continue to act perniciously against us in a lot of different places. It's it's not a good time period for our relations with Russia. The reset didn't work. Um, yes. Uh, I recently read, and I don't know whether it's a reliable source or not, that there are three proposed gas pipeline that must go through Syria to supply gas to Western Europe, which would jeopardize the Russian monopoly uh, heating gas and cooking gas and gas in general for the Western European gives Putin the upper hand and um, allow him to go into um, Crimea to secure his whole world. There's any credibility to those three pipelines that must go through Syria. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the underlying motivations for international diplomacy ends up being oil diplomacy. And certainly, um, Russia right now is fueling 25% of Germany and a large percentage of the rest of Western Europe through its oil through the pipelines that go from Russia. And that is its trump card. Interestingly, the Western Europeans were willing to say at the time of the invasion of the Crimea, um, we don't care. We're, we're willing to put sanctions on you. We don't care if we take a bite because this is really important to us. And I thought that was surprising. Um, it it kind of went against what most people think, you know, ultimately are the motivations of governments. 
but I think they're worried enough about the designs and these expansions. Um, there are proposals that I've heard of for additional pipelines to go through Syria. There, that would be a natural place. Um, the, it would circumvent the reliance that Western Europe has on the oil that comes out of Russia. And so this may well be part of Putin's motivations. So as long as he can control Syria through Assad, then he doesn't have to worry about that. If Assad is toppled and there's some regime that comes in that's pro-Western and he loses his influence, then they can circumvent their reliance on his oil. And that probably scares him. So I think what you're right to point that out as an additional motivation of what's going on there. You mentioned that, that ISIS started out as, as secular former uh, Iraqi officers. Uh, the group that's leading it now, is this, is this ideologically, genuinely a religious movement, or is this a, a secular movement using a religious cover? Well, so the interesting thing about the last years of the Saddam Hussein regime is that he became a secular government that embraced religion as a way of trying to keep himself in power. And all those people in the military that were more or less secular, I think, joined them to that. So, you know, they, they already were embracing religion back then. Um, but the ISIS brand of religion is really a radicalized uh, version of Sunni Islamism, which I don't think is compatible with most of the experience of the Iraqi um, military leaders that are part of ISIS. And so I think that there is right now sort of a uneasy alliance within ISIS. And sometimes, you know, you grab the tiger by the tail, and sometimes the tiger grabs you. Um, I think that the military, who have been very successful, and it does seem like the ISIS military um, strategies have been done not just by freedom fighters that aren't experienced, but by more experienced Republican Guard Iraqi strategists. But at some point, I, I think you're right, that this kind of relationship is going to crumble. It's, it's an unholy alliance, um, given you know the religious nature of it, and the ISIS fundamental radical part is going to dominate, and then I'm not sure what happens. You know, some people say, well, ISIS is real good at taking over territory, but how good are they at controlling territory? Once you have to govern, it becomes much more difficult. You have to moderate. You have to keep the people happy. You have to collect taxes. You have to provide services. To date, they're not doing that all that well, um, and nobody's rising against them because they're so repressive. But we have to wait and see. You know, maybe and there's there are those who think ISIS will just crumble from the inside; it will overextend and then just collapse. I, I don't think so. I think that we're stuck with ISIS for a while. I don't think that airstrikes are going to be successful. Ultimately, it's going to take ground troops and changing the dynamics of repression, um, and that may mean that the U.S. has to commit ground troops or that we have to find better surrogates, because right now, the best surrogates are the Kurds. Um, the Iraqi military, no matter what we do, you know, we did this huge training effort, and they were supposed to get 30,000 new, highly trained Iraqis, and at the end, only 64 graduated. Did you read that in the newspaper? It was very embarrassing for us. That, that, that's not a, a success story. So our surrogates aren't so successful right now in this part of the world. Speaking of surrogates, do the Saudis, in fact, have the third largest Saudis are, yeah, they don't like ISIS at all, and they hate Iran. And right now they're mad at us because we have this new Iran nuclear accord. Uh, they're so mad at us that the king canceled a meeting with President Obama six months ago, and then finally reluctantly met with him um, last month. But right, and, and then meanwhile, the Saudis are attacking um, Yemen in ways that we're not happy about. So. Our relations with Saudi Arabia are, are more complicated now than in the past when you can just count on, on them. Um, they do have a large military, and we've been selling them a lot of weapons. I don't know if their ground forces are any good, but they've got lots of planes now, um, lots of missiles. So they probably will play some role. Yeah. yeah. But will they play the major role? And some people say, if we get out, they'll be forced to play the major role, and we have to force their hand by doing that. I don't, I don't think that'll work. You know, it's like, it's, are we sort of empowering them to be passive because we're doing their job for them? But I, I just don't think they're going to be capable of doing it without us. 
I'm curious about the money. Yeah. What are they doing to prevent us from following the money and preventing us from seizing it? I mean, if we take a lot of their money away, uh, you know, it strikes a big blow. But I'm, I'm wondering, they have all this money. Are they, they're not stashing it in suitcases. And how are they transferring it to other countries? And it would seem to me they've got you some sort of financial institutions. Right. And are other countries assisting them and allowing them to use these financial institutions and helping them hide the money? But it would seem to me we could do a big hit to them if we were able to seize their money, except we, we, we can't seem to find it. So I don't think they are well investing their money right now. Um, you know, what most terrorist organizations and, and um, rogue regimes end up doing is parking their money in Cyprus or in the Cayman Islands or somewhere where they get a good rate of return on their investment. Um, I don't think they are right now. I think they just have their money in the banks, um, in Mosul and Tikrit and the other cities that they control. And the money is useful internally in their area and then you know the, the black market. So they're, they're having to pay extra. Um, interestingly, with respect to the oil, as I mentioned, at first we were letting them pump the oil. We weren't doing anything. Finally, the Security Council passed a resolution that said all countries have to stop taking oil from ISIS-controlled areas of Syria. And there are technological ways of tracking oil. I mean, each oil well has sort of a signature, and you can tell if you want to track where the oil has come from. So there would literally be a way to enforce that against companies that are doing business in oil, but they're not doing that yet. So often the Security Council pass resolutions, and it'll be years, if ever, before there's effective enforcement. And there are, of course, ways to have effective enforcement, but it's easy to pass the resolution and say, look, we're doing something, but to have the political will to impose penalties on corporations that might be nationals of your country or Western you know, allies um, who are doing business with the Syrian oil wells from ISIS, that's harder. And I think um, the, the antiquities, you know, we should be very worried about all the antiquities leaving Syria. Um, I went right after Libya fell to Libya to help the new government um, do uh, elections and put together a bar association and, and deal with human rights. And I went to a place called Magnus, Leptis Magna, which is literally the biggest Roman ruins in the world. And they're not even in Rome or Italy. They're, they're over across the Mediterranean in Libya. And they're beautiful. They're right on the coast. And these things have been there um, for years and years, and nobody knew about them. And I think Syria was like that, too. I mean, Syria has some of the best archaeological spots in the world to visit. And nobody's been visiting them from the West for years and years. Um, and it may be that there won't be anything left to visit after ISIS is through with it. But um, right now, people, I guess you know, some people are saying, uh, yeah, well, at least you know, take this stuff out. Don't demolish it. Send it. You know, we'll buy it. And um, you, there will probably be a lot of litigation over the provenance of antiquities that have come out of Syria from this period for the next 100 years. So. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, if I was in the business of running the military, this threat seems like it would be a dream come true. Um, I have a really hard time uh, believing that, A, our military did not in foresee the consequences of, of, of leaving weapons behind, and, uh, or B, uh, suddenly unaccounting for them. Um, and on that note, is there... Uh, a way either through international law or civilian law to hold militaries accountable for those kinds of decisions or unaccountability or I don't know. I'm not well, I, mean, I, I don't know what the conspiracy theory would be for why we would be so stupid to do those things. Um, you know, and it, it, I, I think we just thought that we had to protect our military from chemical weapons, so we leapfrogged over rather than fought through the desert and, and found all the caches. Um, and I think that there were good humanitarian reasons that just ended up being the bad ones, you know, in, in effect, for just banning the military, not letting them serve. Um, but those decisions were made at the highest level. And so there are those from time to time who would like to prosecute the Bush administration, Cheney, the others that were responsible for the whole invasion of Iraq. 
And this would be, you know, one of the exhibits. Look, this is what it, it caused. Um, there isn't really a place to prosecute them. Uh, you can't prosecute them in the United States. The International Criminal Court does not have jurisdiction over them. Um, if you're talking about war crimes, it's possible that Iraq could decide to join the ICC and trigger its jurisdiction over war crimes, but not over the crime of aggression, which is really what the big crime would be here. So yeah, this is a, an area where the people who made those decisions are not going to be held accountable. And for whatever reason, they made the decision. So, um, all right, so let me uh, close up the part of the discussion by saying these issues are not going away. You're going to be seeing ISIS in the news, the Syrian immigration crisis, um, issues about the antiquities. There's so many legal issues that are related to this. So it has been a great pleasure to tell you about them today. Let me tell you a little bit about what's going on up at the University Circle. Um, and encourage you, especially since there's so many alumni here, to come up and give us a visit. So um, the big news is our law faculty was just ranked 25th best in the country um, by the CISC study, which is a study of faculty publications and citations. And it's, it's really nice that my colleagues and I have been able to write about these kinds of issues and we're being cited in court cases and by publications and we're being recognized nationally. Um, the school uh, just got a, a brand new blue courtroom, so when you come up for conferences and stuff, we have a beautiful facility uh, to share with you. Um, the students that we've been bringing in have been spectacular. They're coming from all over the country. My Cody, Jessica Berg, and I are very aggressive on being on the trail, um, recruiting students and doing fundraising, and it's paid off. And so. Much like Cleveland, the school is really in a, in a good place right now, and we were very, very pleased that after 21 months of interim dean, um, we became permanent deans, and everybody on the faculty um, and the students and our alum are really committed to moving the school continuously forward. So it's a really exciting time for the school, and we're glad that you come to our events, and we encourage you to continue to do that. Um, with that, I will close the session, and thank you all, have a great day.